Thank you, everyone. Uh, if you have extra questions for Logan or more about some of the water quality, like the last question, um, hold those questions and we'll try to answer those at lunchtime for you. Our next speaker we're really proud to present to you is Stan Buman from Agron, and he is going to talk to us about precision conservation, helping farmers make the best conservation decisions. Thank you, Jessica. So um, we are going to switch gears here a little bit. We have been talking about precision agriculture, and I want to talk a little bit about precision conservation. When you look at the nutrient reduction strategy, so these are the strategies states are putting in place as to how much we need to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus. If you look at Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, a lot of those states are calling for a 45% reduction in nutrients leaving the farm on ni uh, both nitrogen and phosphorus. If you look at the 4R stuff, the 4R stuff is critical to helping us reach our goals. But with the 4R stuff, we can only get about maybe 8 to 12% reduction. If everybody adopts it and follows the 4Rs perfectly, we can get about 8 to 12% reduction. So what that tells me is we need to do a lot more. What is that lot more? And that's what we're going to talk about is the precision conservation part to help us get down to those goals so we can avoid that regulation. So Agron is a company founded by my brother and I back in 97. Between the two of us, we had about 25 years in with the uh, USDA NRCS. And we just kept thinking there had to be a faster way to deliver conservation. And that's really what our company is about, is revolutionizing conservation delivery. How do we do that? Well, it really is through the precision farming. It's helping farmers understand the decisions that they're making and make the best decisions to meet their goals. And that's what I'm going to run through today. So quiz time. Everybody have a paper and pencil with you. My question for you is take a farm that you know best. I don't care whether you're a farmer or not farmer, just one you know best. How much soil did you lose on that farm, tons per acre, last year? Everybody know that number? My guess is we probably don't know that number. When I'm talking to a lot of city folks, the question I like to ask is, how much energy did you lose out of your front door this last winter? And people look at me like, I don't have a clue, and why are you asking that? It goes back to if we don't know what we're losing, we're probably not going to make change, right? When was the last time you replaced your front door? When was the last time you put in insulation, blah, blah, blah? I don't give it a lot of thought. Why? Because we don't measure it. And I think the same is true with soil loss. If we don't know what we're losing, you know, you know, I don't see a lot. You know, after big heavy rains, I see the gullies in the field. But, you know, other than that, I really don't see that slow movement. And that's really where we're losing our soils, that slow creeping down the hill year after year where we're losing our biggest soil loss. What is a tolerable rate of soil loss? Maybe that's the first thing we need to answer. This might be surprising. You talk to soil scientists and they'll say, yeah, there's really not a loss that's tolerable. But I would also go back and say, well, OK, probably achieving zero soil loss is darn near impossible. Even under solid prairie grasses, there was some erosion. Okay, so what should we shoot for? Well, under really good conditions, soil can rebuild at a rate of about a quarter ton per acre per year. So if you're over that, your field is literally going downhill. At a lot of conferences, I like to pull farmers and ask questions about what is the single biggest challenge you have, that you face in your efforts to do more soil and water conservation on your farm? Predominantly, the number one answer that I get is, I'm unsure what conservation practices are the biggest bang for my buck. That's a more common answer than, um, I feel conservation practices limit my ability to maximize production, I'm not satisfied with the assistance I get, or I don't see the need on my farm. The number one is, I really don't know what the biggest bang for my buck is. And that's really what 
the Agron software does in, in my mind. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our offering. And the offering usually comes from one of two levels. One is through state or federal agencies. So like next week, I'm headed out to Vermont to train the state employees on running the software. But I also spend about half of my time working with Land O'Lakes through Winfield and the local ag retailers to use this software. So when I'm talking about the software, it's not just for conservation agencies. That's typically who we have thought about in the past of delivering conservation. But what about those ag retailers, the people who are working daily with farmers? You know, they have a touch point to the farmer that nobody else has. And so I really am talking a wide range of people here that can use the software. Uh, there's three different tiers. Tier one really is just to start that conversation. It's a couple maps, a couple easy to look at maps. The first one is, what is the water erosion risk on my farm? Where's the highs and the lows? It has nothing to do with your practices, what your rotation is, what your tillage is. It's just what is the erosion risk across that field? And then the second one is a digital elevation model. It's based off of LIDAR elevation. Uh, in a lot of states, we have an elevation reading for every square meter. So of those of you who are metrically challenged, like me, that's roughly about every three to three and a half feet. By three and a half feet, we have an elevation reading. And so we've harnessed that to really deliver conservation in a whole new way. Uh, tier two is more of a generalization. The tier two tools are not really set up to get down to nuts and bolts specific on each farm. But the way that we have ag retailers using this is they don't necessarily want to point fingers. They just want to start a conversation. So they may send me, you know, 40,000 acres of, um, of, of outlined fields of shape files and say, Stan, here's what I want you to run. I want you to run a scenario where somebody might be doing corn bean with tillage each fall. And then I might want you to run an option where they're um, no tilling one year, but still doing fall tillage on corn stalks or vice versa. And then their third may be, well, what if we no till? I can run all of those acres in a batch process, get individual reports for each field, and then they can go out to the farmer and have that conversation that is, you know, if you're roughly in this bucket, if you're doing more of that conventional till, this is what your soil loss is. If you are reducing that by, you know, a more minimum tillage, this is roughly what your soil loss would be. And if you're no tilling, this is what your soil loss would be. So it's really to continue that discussion, but it's not drilled down to the nuts and bolts because they may not know exactly how many tillage passes you're doing, whether it's fall tillage, spring tillage, your rotation, et cetera. So the tier two is just Let's put them in buckets. Let's give them general information. Tier three, however, really gets into the nuts and bolts. This is where you would be interviewing the farmer and saying, so tell me about your operation. What are you doing following that bean crop? Are you doing any tillage in the fall? Are you putting anhydrous on? Are you planting cover crops? What are you doing in the spring? What are you doing after that corn crop? Do you have wheat in the rotation? What is your rotation? You're really drilling down, and then you can come up with an erosion specific to the farm. Then you could say, so what have you thought about doing? Well, you know, they keep talking about cover crops. They offer some incentive. What would it do for soil erosion if I were to put in cover crops? And so then we can run that alternative. So we can do up to three alternatives and give you comparisons on what, it would, ha what would happen on your farm with the different levels of soil loss under those three managements. Other practices, and I'll run through these individually, but we have tools for planting ponds. So remember before when I said we have digital elevation data, we have probably 10 states of data loaded. So if somebody calls me up and says, I want a pond, I can go into the computer and in about 15 minutes, I can plan a pond for them. I can give them the biggest pond, the smallest pond. I can give them a cost estimate. I can show them what that pool area is going to look like. And they can quickly make a decision of, do I want to proceed or do I not want to proceed? If they want to proceed, OK, continue out the engineering process, although I would say that probably 90 plus percent of it's already done. Basins is the same way. This is more like a terrace or a basin instead of a grassed waterway. What if I put a basin in and I shut that water off with a structure and put that water underground through a tile line? 
And so we can provide that information too. We can plan that one out in probably about 15 minutes. Wetland builder, same thing. We can plan out wetlands, get the footprint, what the cost is in minutes. Grass waterway, same thing. We can provide the design. You know, what's it going to look like? What's the width? What's the depth? We can also take that information and give it to the contractor. So literally, if a contractor woke up today and said, Stan, I'm going to move to Farmer John's place and I want to be able to build a waterway. If he has machine control, I could sit down at my computer, I could plan out that waterway, and I could send him a file that he loads into his dozer, and if he has the blade control on it, he can start building by the time he gets that machine moved over to the field and ready to go. It, re it really is that fast. Russell 2, how many know what Russell 2 is? Anybody work with Russell 2? few of you. Every time I want to use Russell 2, I have to pull out a cheat sheet to figure out how to run it. It's not an easy program. What Russell 2 is, it's the revised universal soil loss equation. It's a way of determining how much soil loss you're losing across the field, all across our nation. So it's really looking at the factors of what's your climate, lots of rainfall, heavy rainfall, blah, blah, blah. What's the soil erosivity? What is the slope length and slope steepness across your field? What is the practices on your field, like are you a corn corn or corn bean or corn bean wheat or are you potatoes and alfalfa? And then uh, what's your tillage? And then the extra part is do you have any other supporting practices? Are you contouring? Do you have terraces? All of that's fed into this equation to give you a soil loss. So the way a lot of soil losses are done is somebody will look at your field and they'll pick out a critical dominant soil and they'll say, well, if you have a sea slope, usually that runs, you know, 7% and your slope length is 200 foot. It's just book values, but it doesn't really get you an answer as far as what's happening across your field. So we've taken Russell 2, and now instead of just running it on a critical area in the field, we're actually using it every 30 foot by 30 foot, we're running Russell 2. So I like to tease my friends at NRCS and say, we calculate, we run Russell 2 more in one day than all your staff across the nation does in a year. Because we're literally running it 30 foot by 30 foot, so thousands upon thousands of times in each field. But what you end up getting is a map showing you the highs and lows across the field. So in my mind, it's kind of like a yield map. If somebody parachutes into your farm and they sample the corn, you know, they pick ears in a 10 foot by 10 foot area and they say, oh, your yield is 183 bushel per acre this year. What does that tell you? Not a lot. I agree. And I think that's where we've been with soil loss, when people say, well, your soil loss is X ton, 8 ton per acre. Well, that's if you can find a spot in that field that has that slope length and that slope steepness. With this, we can start getting more detailed. Now start laying your yield maps over here. And I think most of you are aware that there's pretty good correlation between high erosion and low yield. And this can help prove that. So. Here's three scenarios I talked about before. We can do up to three scenarios in one run of soil calculator. The first one is more of a conventional till. So that would be like going in and disc ripping in the fall and then coming in in the spring and field cultivating. So on that one, we're roughly 1,986 ton per year. That, that's the erosion within the field. Okay, so not all of that's leaving the field, right? It gets down to a low area, a flat area, and it settles out. But leaving the field in this example, we have 1,526 ton per year. That's still a lot leaving. What if they no-till one every other year? What, how does that change it? Well, on this farm, it goes from 18 or 1986 down to 1,273 ton per acre. Look at the no-till. If they go to no-till, it drops it down to 157 ton per acre. 
huge difference in the amount of sediment leaving. What does that mean for the nutrient reduction strategy? It may not make a lot of difference on nitrogen. Why? Because nitrogen moves with water and it can leach. But phosphorus, phosphorus attached to the soil particle, so not the particulate, well, the particulate, 157 ton, average cross field. 144 ton of sediment delivered off the field. So these are the numbers that it can generate. We can help farmers start to understand why some of these practices are important. So going back to the best bang for my buck, again, it depends upon what the farmer wants. Is he interested in soil erosion, soil transport, water quality, soil health, other? Different practices will give you different answers for these. It's not like we can implement one practice and it takes care of all of these. Some practices are great in all these columns, other practices, not so good. So we need to help answer those questions of what's going on. That's what Conservation Analyzer is about. So I'm gonna to run to the back of the room real quick. And I'm going to actually run through a, a web-based program. And I'm going to start turning on and off features. And you can see what kind of answers we get given on the different practices. Oh, I think I'm good. So this is the Conservation Analyzer program that we're working on. This is kind of the capstone of all of our other practices. So you can see right now I really don't have anything turned on. But I can turn on this alternative one. And let's say we're interested in soil health. Well, if we're looking at a corn bean rotation and we're doing fall tillage in the spring and in the fall, the soil health, the lighter the color, the better. So the dark blue is bad soil health. We can start looking at soil health across that field. You can see we're not doing so good in the soil health, if that is your interest. If we go to alternative two, again, we're no tilling one or every other year. We've lost a lot of that blue and we've moved more to the light color. If we go to the no-till, wow, we've really changed soil health. Okay, so what if we're not interested in soil health? What if we're interested more in the soil erosion? So these are the same pictures you saw before, alternative one, two, and alternative three. But now what if we start looking at some of the conservation practice, some of the structural practices? So when I look at the sediment delivery on alternative one, uh, delivered is 1526. What if I put a pond in? What if I'm a farmer and I wanna be able to irrigate during those dry parts of the year and I put a pond in. What does that do for sediment delivery? Well, it reduced it to 827 ton. Why? Because all of that water that's draining into the pond, almost all of that sediment is going to be deposited behind the dam. And I use this just as an example because it's easy to visualize. You're putting in a big structure and you're stopping all that water. So we greatly reduce the amount of water that's running into, or into that stream down below. All right, well, pond's not really feasible in this case. So what if I wanted basins? Well, let me turn on a few water and sediment control basins here. And as I turn those on, it tells you what the sediment delivery is. And we've reduced it down to 1190. Uh, soil health really doesn't affect soil health at all. Uh, the annual cost, 1324 so that would be the cost of the practices amortized over the life of the structure. And then the other part is by putting in those basins, it's costing us about $4 per ton of soil removed from downstream or off that farm. And so I can keep going through these. I can say, well, how does that happen in alternative two? I can turn the basins on and I can make those same comparisons. Um, I can also look at, you know, terraces. What if we put terraces in? What's the cost to remove a ton of soil or to reduce a ton of leaving the farm? And so that's really what this is about is getting to those economic decisions. What's the best practice for me? What's it going to cost me? What's it going to do for 
tons kept on the farm. Uh, one other thing I'll show you real quick here is the buffers. So working with Land of Lakes, we actually developed a buffer tool. In the state of Minnesota, all farms along a stream need a 50-foot buffer. They wrote something very interesting into their law, though. They said, unless you have something that will do comparative level of sediment reduction. And everybody's kind of looking at each other like, oh, wow, what does that mean? Well, we now have the information, so we worked with Land O'Lakes to build a buffer builder tool. And what we can do now is start looking at changing or moving that grass around. We all know there's areas where water does not flow perpendicular into the stream, right? To get into the stream, it'd have to go up a little embankment. It may flow parallel to that stream for a quarter mile before it enters it. And the farmers up in Minnesota is like, why do I need a buffer if water's not flowing through it anyway? Well, you don't. With variable width buffers, we can usually reduce the amount seeded down by about 40 to 60 percent. So in other words, if in this field you need about 10 acres of buffer, you could get by with about four to six acres of buffer if you strategically place that grass. So this is a 50-foot buffer. If I click on the variable width buffer, you can see there's a lot less grass here, but there's some wider areas. You know, some of this might be a little bit wider than 50 foot, but you get down here, there's not much water flowing from the field directly into the stream. So we can get by with, you know, probably a minimum of 16 and a half foot buffer. So these are the tools we're working on. It's really to help farmers make better decisions, whether that's through their ag retailer or working with uh, the different uh, government agencies. So got about a couple minutes. Any questions I can answer on these? Yes? So a health is soil conditioning index. Is any soil sample taken in there? Is it what? Any taken No, it was something developed by, I'm going to say ARS. I may be wrong on that, but I think it was ARS. And it's really looking at how much tillage is being done and residue levels, et cetera, what's happening to the field. And they're using that as a gauge. And it's still probably one of the better gauges we have out there for, for a general number across the U.S. If the Soil and Water Conservation Districts license the tools, yes. If they don't, no. <laughs> they can call me and they can license the tools, yep. Now, if a farmer is working with, um, through one of the Winfield retailers, they could call them and they would put them in contact with me and I would run it for them. Yep. Other questions? Uh, so it depends really upon what you're doing. Are you licensed, are you in one county or are you in three or four or statewide? Um, and then also how many tools do you want? And how many people are going to be using that license? So to give you a scenario, if one person wanted to use three of the tools in one county, you'd probably be somewhere around, I want to say $4,400 a year. So I don't think it's something that farmers are necessarily going to license, but I think the people supporting the farmers would license it to help a broad area. Yes? Yes. So I didn't mention that, but we can look at whether you're chisel plowing, plowing, uh, vertical till, strip till, no till, ridge till, field cultivating, disking, about any tillage practice you can imagine can be modeled through that. And then also what happens if you put in cover crops or what if you have potatoes or, you know, whatever, imagine any rotation. So, you know, in Iowa, I always joke that our three biggest land uses are corn, beans, and road ditches, and I think that's pretty true. But you get into other states and you get a lot of vegetables and small grains and almonds, you name it. 
the Russell 2 program is set up to plan about anything you can throw at it. Yes? Mm -hmm. And there's somewhat limited research in different geographies and soil types. Your model, in terms of projecting how a suite of practices will respond, is going to be dependent on the integrity of your data. So my question is, where does the data come from? To yeah, so all of our data really comes from the Ag Research Service. Um, we don't like the idea of just making up data. We want data that's defensible. So we really use ARS data. We've worked very close with them in building all of these tools. Data integrity is critical. Other questions, or are we out of time here? One more, anybody? Okay. I'm gonna turn it back to you, Jessica, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Our last speaker of the session.